I know what you're thinking. Has he finished six sessions of this Bible study or just five? And to tell you the truth, in all the excitement, I kind of lost track myself. But seeing as how this is a 73-book Bible inspired by the Holy Spirit that would blow your head clean off, you got to ask yourself one question. Do you feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't help myself. Uh, to begin session seven, I thought it would be good to kind of have a segue with none other than an impersonation, weak though it may have been, of Clint Eastwood, Dirty Harry himself. And this, my friends, is far more powerful than a 44 Magnum, a 73 book Bible inspired by the Holy Spirit. Not only blowing our heads off, blowing our hearts, blowing our, our whole lives so that we might be filled with the Holy Spirit uh, and do uh, the Father's will. So we don't need luck, as Dirty Harry asked. What we need is light and love of the Holy Spirit to begin session seven about our Samaritan sandwich. And did you notice, incidentally, that as Dirty Harry is going through and shooting all six bullets out of his 44 Magnum, he's eating a sandwich. He's finishing his Samaritan sandwich. And so yet another happy segue into our session today. Let's begin not with luck, but with the love of the Holy Spirit. He who is the love of the Father and the Son, the eternal love. May he fill our minds and hearts. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the faiths of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of your faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolations. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. St. Luke, pray for us. St. Jerome, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Before we get into the Samaritan sandwich, the topic of session 7, we do our usual review of session six, which was telling time, telling time. So if you would take out, uh, by now I hope you have your uh, homeworks finished, and I know you're anxious to see uh, that you've got 10 out of 10, no doubt. And so let us review the answers, and we'll use this as a kind of uh, preparation, getting us up to speed uh, for the session today as we wrap up session six, telling time. Number one, the divine economy is God's fatherly plan for his people in history and in eternity. And do you remember what we kind of delved a little bit into the etymology of the word economy? It comes from two words, oikos nomos, economy, meaning the, the law of the household. God's fatherly plan. And his house is not just the earth, but it also includes time and eternity. So this is God's divine economy that governs everything, time and eternity. And so the divine economy is the Father's plan for his people in history and in eternity. And we saw how the cross was the intersection of history and eternity. So number one is obviously true. Number two, as part of Israel's economic legislation, a jubilee was celebrated every hundred years. I hope you caught that. Hundred years and jubilee clash. No, a jubilee was every 50 years. So number two is false. Number three, the Hebrew word sheva means seven and theologically symbolizes a covenant. And that is true. You, you might recall how we talked about the seven days of creation weren't a chronological list of how long it took God to create the world, but a theological uh, signification of seven being God's desire to create a covenant, to invite us to be part of this family. And so that's why it took seven days, in a sense. This is kairos time, not chronos time. Not the time of Stephen Hawking, but the time of the children of God. 
that golden opportunity in which we recognize he is our father and we have been called to be his children. So Sheba, the word, the number seven is just jam packed with theological meaning, especially when we're talking about the seven days of creation, which is the creation of the initial primordial and everlasting covenant with man and with all of creation. Number four, Jesus told his church to publish a book and get people to read it. No, that's what I said. I'm going to publish a book and I want everybody to read it so we can raise money for Catholic schools. No, that's not what Jesus told his church. He told them to go out in Matthew 28, his great commission, go out to all the world and baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In other words, go out to all the world and give them the sacraments. And so number four is false. Number five, that that should be the goal of all study of the sacred page, to be able to live it. Sacred page is simply a, a, another way of saying uh, the Holy Bible. To be able to live it and proclaim it as a life-changing reality, to cleave hearts asunder and set hearts ablaze, and that is absolutely true. Number six. I'm sorry, that's number five. Number six, all of salvation history can be seen as leading to the liturgy, to the sacraments. And that is true. I'm taking a lot of these uh, points from Consuming the Word, um, that chapter that I asked everyone to read uh, last time. And so uh, the scriptures, uh, our Christian life is fulfilled in the sacraments. It's leading to the celebration of the sacraments. Number Six is true, therefore. Number seven, the kingdom of Christ is closely connected with the ancient kingdom of David. That is true. And the key reason why is because the Davidic kingdom, the kingdom of David, wasn't just an, uh, a kingdom in the sense of uh, a nation which governs itself. Once you become a kingdom, you govern other nations. So that's the key difference between a nation, which is what Moses created, uh, through the covenant at Mount Sinai, he created a nation of Israel. But when David comes, he governs not just the nation of Israel, but other nations that surround it. And so he becomes a kingdom. And in that sense, David's kingdom is Catholic. It's Catholicos. It's universal. Stretches all beyond its national limits. It's international. And in that sense, the kingdom of Christ which is international, closely resembles the kingdom of David. So number seven is true <laughs> in the midst of all that, in case you didn't catch the answer. Number eight, Christ serves as a model for both the active and the contemplative life. We see in his example both the dignity of labor and the higher duty of laying aside work for prayer. And that's from Luke chapter 5, verse 16, the footnote where Jesus leaves his pastoral ministry to take time to be in communion with God through contemplative prayer, personal prayer. Number nine, in the year 2000, John Paul II asked first world countries to forgive the debts of third world countries, and that is true. By the way, number eight is true, number nine is true, and number 10, a good confession is the source and summit of the Christian life. There was another one I was trying to trip you up on, catch you falling asleep, uh, number 10 is false. What is the source and summit of Christian life? Well, duh, Father John, that's the Eucharist, the source and the summit of Christian life. That's what we're all leading. Uh, the whole Christian life is leading to and where it all flows from, like a mountain peak. We go up to it on Sunday. The whole week leads up to Sunday, and then the whole rest of the week flows from the graces that we receive at Mass on Sunday. And what a challenging time we're living to, through in this coronavirus crisis, where we feel that distance from the mountaintop, from the Eucharistic celebration, not only being together as a people of God, but being together with God as a people of God, and being in the midst of the liturgical celebration, giving God the praise that He desires and wants in spirit and in truth, as he told the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, which we'll look at today. So those are the answers to session 6. Enough of that. Let's get to something else.
since we're all hungry. Let's get to what we're going to discuss today, which is the Samaritan sandwich. Like Dirty Harry, we're still chewing on our sandwich because we're asking, do you feel lucky today? And so here's what I asked you to cover, and you might note that I've asked from a little different from the study notes. I actually ask you to read all of Luke chapter 9 as well as all of Luke chapter 10 in the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible and the footnotes. And there was a little word study on the word Exodus. And I really, uh, really wanted to just summarize quickly Luke 9 and 10 by just pointing out four things, uh, two things in each chapter. Luke chapter 9 is the sending out of the 12 apostles, a missionary journey, which Pope Francis is asking all of us to undertake, and that to be our spirituality as Catholics. We should be missionary-minded. And so chapter 9 and chapter 10 both begin with a missionary uh, mandate. Chapter 9 begins with the missionary mandate to the 12 apostles, to Jesus' closest companions. And then uh, later on in chapter 9, you have the great transfiguration where Jesus is accompanied by Moses and Elijah on Mount Tabor, and they discuss his exodus, his deliverance, his departure from this world to heaven, where he will lead us in our exodus to the real promised land, which is not the territory of Israel, ultimately. It is the promised land of heaven. So those two key things happen in chapter 9, the mission of the twelve and the transfiguration. And then in chapter 10, you have something also very beautiful, the mission, missionary mandate of the 70, sometimes 72 different manuscripts uh, describe uh, sometimes 70 and sometimes the sending of the 72 disciples. This is not the 12 apostles, but the larger group of disciples. And then also in chapter 10, you have well, one of my favorites uh, of, among Jesus' parables, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Hence, it becomes the perfect uh, opportunity to discuss uh, who are the Samaritans. And they really play a very uh, pivotal role in Jesus' ministry and a very challenging role to the Jews. That Jesus is so sympathetic to the Samaritans. And the hero in the parable of the Good Samaritan is... None other than the Good Samaritan himself. He's the one who stops. He's the one who helps. Uh, not only that, but he's ex ex exceedingly generous with a man who has, been, um, who has been waylaid by bandits. If you had a chance to read the footnotes, I hope you noticed St. Augustine's uh, allegorical interpretation. Uh, St. Augustine and the early church fathers, uh, that's why I really like the Catholic, Ignatius Catholic Study Bible because it brings out these various interpretations over the course of the centuries. And so St. Augustine in the 4th century and the 5th century said that uh, that man who had been waylaid by robbers is like Adam. It's like Adam who has been waylaid by Satan. And now Jesus comes and he is the one who binds our wounds and puts us in the church, which is the inn where he provides for our healing and our whole wholeness and our happiness uh, until he returns to take us home to heaven. So the Good Samaritan became for St. Augustine, and if we read the early church fathers for us as well, a, a story, a parable, not just about being nice to strangers, but about our own uh, history, our own destiny, how we were the ones who were in need, and how Christ comes as the Good Samaritan to save us and to provide for all we need, being exceedingly generous with his grace to us. So that's what I hope you read and understood in chapters 9 and chapter 10. Now, I'd like us to enjoy a little sandwich, the Samaritan sandwich. In order to do that, even before we get to the material that hopefully you have in your study guides, I thought we needed a running start because there's some preliminary background information that we need even to understand my study guide before we can understand the chapters, especially chapter 10 and Jesus' uh, great attention and love for the Samaritans. Who are these people? 
And so before we can answer that question, who are the Samaritans, we first have to know two things. First of all, some of the key moments in the history of Israel. In the Old Testament, you have to understand at least the, the, the thousand years between the establishment of the kingdom and the coming of Christ. Because that's the time in which the Samaritans come on the scene. So you have to know the scene before you can understand who's acting in front of the scene. And so we're going to set the scene by, by describing uh, certain key moments in the history of that thousand years. The second thing is the word or the name Israel. We have to be careful because we might hear the word Israel and we think it has one meaning. But in fact, it has a, a cornucopia of meanings. It has a multiple meanings. And so I'm going to identify for you at least six meanings. And there's probably more than that. But at least you should have these six meanings of the word Israel. Because that too is part of the context for the Samaritan people. Who are they? Uh, and in order to understand them, you have to understand some of the timeline of the Old Testament, and you have to understand at least the meaning of the word Israel in the Old Testament. So we're going to do that first before we get into the footnotes for today. So if I could direct your attention to the chalkboard. Uh, first, on your left-hand side, we have uh, six milestones. Six milestones. And so you might want to jot these down. What I do is in my own study guide, you see we have the, the printed text on one side. That you should have at home. You should be looking at that. But then what I do is when I realize this is not enough, I better give them some more background information, I write down my notes on this side. And so that's basically what you have on the blackboard behind me. So you might use that side of your... Uh, study guide to write these things down. The first key moment in the thousand years prior to Christ is roughly the year 1030, the year 1030 BC, before Christ. And that is when you have the period of the United Kingdom. There's basically three kings who rule under uh, over the United Kingdom. That is Saul, David, and Solomon. Saul, David, and Solomon. It really reaches its high point, its zenith, its glory days, the United Kingdom under David. And you might even say even more so under Solomon because he's the one who gets to build the temple. But then it crashes and burns pretty quickly after that. When does it crash and burn? About 100 years after it started. In 930 BC, you have the divided kingdom. Very critical moment in the history of Israel, where you have the division of the 12 tribes of the United Kingdom. Well, what was united in the United Kingdom? The 12 tribes of Israel. Who are the 12 tribes of Israel? They're the 12 sons of Jacob. They are the families that they gave birth to, and each had a piece of property, as we discussed last time. How Joshua, upon entering the Holy Land, the Promised Land, divided up the land so that each of the 12 tribes would have a heritage forever, except the tribe of Levi, which we discussed in the Palestinian power brokers, you might remember. The tribe of Levi had the temple, and their job was to minister at the temple. And they got that job in Exodus 32, when the people worshiped the golden calf, and Moses asks, who is on the side of the Lord? And the Levites rise up and say, we are on the side of the Lord. And they go through the camp and slay 3,000 Israelites who had been worshiping the golden calf. And so from that point onward, Moses says, you have ordained yourselves as priests. So when Joshua takes the baton of leadership from Moses and leads the people into the promised land, he divides that land up into uh, 11 different parcels, you might say. And he leaves the temple in Jerusalem and its worship to uh, the Levites. So the divided kingdom is the moment at which the ten northern tribes split from the two southern tribes of Judah and Benjamin. And now you have this 
this rivalry. So 10, 930 is a key moment. It is really a civil war. And we'll discuss that in just a second. Because that's the analogy I would like to use to understand the Samaritans. Next, the key moment is 722. You have the Assyrian exile. The Assyrians came down from the northeast and destroyed the northern kingdom, the ten tribes. And from then on, they would be called the ten lost tribes because the Assyrians... Uh, 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 <laughs> i got several words coming into my head at the same time, and I can't pick one. Uh, dispersed them all over the world, intermingling with, with pagan peoples. And so they're, they've never been brought back together, the, the, the return of the lost ten tribes, until the coming of Christ, which was prophesied. So the Assyrian exile is the obliteration of the ten tribes of the north. Keep that in mind. During this time, you still have fairly intact the two tribes in the south. And from that point on, they were called uh, the tribes of Judah or the area of Judea. And that point is when you have the name Jews. Prior to the time of uh, the divided kingdom, you never used the word Jews to refer to the chosen people. It was only after the division of the ten northern tribes and the two southern tribes, that now you have the two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, in this area of Judea, that you have the word Jews. And from then on, they're called the Jews. Well, in 586, they're taken into exile by the Babylonians. King Nebuchadnezzar comes in and deports all the Jews from Judea into exile in Babylon. And then in the 5th century B.C., 5th century B.C. means the 400s B.C., you have a rival temple being built in Mount Gerizim. Mount Gerizim. This is north of Jerusalem. So in 539, five, in the 530s, you have the Babylonian exile is over. And the people are returning, the Jews are returning to Judea, and they're building their temple under Zerubbabel. And at the same time, the Samaritans are building a rival temple in Mount Gerizim, which is just north of Jerusalem. Okay. And then in 129 and in 113, Somewhere between 129 and 113. The more books you start to read about the history of the Old Testament, the more confused you get. <laughs> so uh, in one book that I read, it said John Hyrcanus destroys the temple in Mount Gerizim in 129. Another book that I read said, no, that didn't happen until 113. So I'm just putting both of them. Somewhere between 129 and 113, John Hyrcanus, who is now... Uh, ruling the roost in charge of the temple as priest and as governor in Jerusalem after the exiles have returned from the Babylonian captivity. He decides to go up north to Mount Gerizim, destroys the temple at Mount Gerizim so that there is no more rivalry. And you and I might be sitting here thinking, well, what's the big deal? Who goes around destroying churches? <laughs> what, what's the what's the what's the impact? What's the collateral? What's the what's the benefit of doing something like that? Well, recall uh, our discussion of uh, Palestinian power brokers, and what were they brokering the power of the power of the temple, and why were they so interested in brokering the power of the temple? Because the temple was not just a church like you and I think of a church today. It was the center of civilization for them. It was, as we, we read in Scott Hahn, it is the White House, it is Wall Street, it is the Pentagon, it is the Library of Congress, it is Fort Knox, all of that rolled into one. Because in uh, Jewish history, in the history of that we're talking about in the Old Testament, you didn't have this division in government and in 
spirituality. It was all together. And so if you were to destroy someone's temple, it was to destroy their whole civilization, their whole way of life. And that's why John Hyrcanus goes up to the Samaritans and destroys the temple on Mount Gerizim. It's like he dropped a nuclear bomb on their White House and their Wall Street and their Pentagon and their you know, Harvard and, and Princeton. Sorry, Elaine Pagels. But it would be to destroy their whole civilization. That's why temples were so critical. And that's why the Samaritans wanted to build one on Mount Gerizim and not just uh, let uh, the Jews have theirs in Jerusalem. So you get an idea. Keep these dates in mind. 1030, 930 BC, 722, 586, the 5th century BC, the Samaritans build a rival temple. And around 129 to 113 BC, John Hyrcanus destroys the temple at Mount Gerizim. Okay, now let's look at the word Israel. And for those of you who were in my class in, um, uh, in the study of the Gospel of Mark, you might remember we went through these six different uh, definitions of the word Israel. Uh, so now let me introduce to all of you who weren't in that class uh, at least six different meanings the word or the name Israel. First of all, Israel can refer to a human being. Sometimes when you open the pages of the Bible and you see the word Israel, like for example in Genesis 32, that word Israel is referring to a human being, an individual person named Jacob. He wrestles with the angel in Genesis 32 and then it's a truce, neither one wins. And the angel bestows upon Jacob the name Israel. From then on, Jacob's name was Israel. And so when you talk about the 12 tribes of Israel, the word Israel, the flip side of it is Jacob. These are the 12 sons that form the 12 tribes of Israel, Jacob. In fact, a lot of times you even see Jacob written slash Israel because they're both referring to the same person. It can also refer to the kingdom of Israel, and in this sense, the united kingdom, all 12 tribes together. So sometimes you're reading along in the Bible, 73 holy books that will blow your head clean off, and you think, there's the word Israel, that must refer to Jacob. Well, it doesn't. In that context, it might refer to the united kingdom, all the Israelites the Israelites were led forth by Moses into the wilderness. The Israelites entered into the promised land. David ruled over the nation of Israel. Well, that refers, or the kingdom of Israel, that refers to the 12 tribes of Israel. So that's another meaning of Israel. It can refer to a person. It can refer to a kingdom. A third meaning is after 930, the 10 tribes of the north are referred to as Israel as opposed to the two tribes in the south who are referred to as Jews. So now you have the Israelites distinguished from the Jews. The Israelites are the ten tribes in the north. The Jews are the two tribes in the south, Judah and Benjamin. So that's another meaning of Israel, it refers to the ten tribes. You with me so far? Go get another cup of coffee. You look tired. Number four, it is the political nation of Israel that was uh, established by the United Nations in May of 1948. May of 1948, you have a political entity called Israel. Number five, it is the land area, Israel. You can find it on a map. It has certain boundaries, a certain territory. Israel refers to dirt, <laughs> a land area, a territory of Israel. It can also refer to, and this is my favorite, in the New Testament, St. Paul in writing to the Galatians in chapter 6, verse 16, another one of my favorite, very mysterious, very uh, spiritually packed and powerful uh, verses, Galatians 6, 16. Uh, St. Paul says, almost at the end of the letter, only six chapters in Galatians, you are the Israel of God. He's referring to the church. The church must understand herself as the new Israel of God. That everything that God was trying to do with Israel 
the person and the people he has now done and is doing in each of us as the new Israel of God. So you have now six different meanings of the word Israel. Please keep these in mind because depending on where you are in the Bible and reading along, it can refer to different things. It can refer to a person, Jacob. It can refer to a united kingdom, all 12 tribes under David. It can refer to just the 10 tribes in the north. It can refer to a political entity. It can refer to a land area. It can refer ultimately to the church. Keep all these things in mind because the Samaritans will also consider themselves Israelites. In fact, the true Israelites. And they will consider the Jews and even the Galileans in the north uh, traitors, false Israelites. The Jews, I'm, I'm sorry, the Samaritans are the ones who are preserving the authentic and true message uh, and the tradition of their ancestor Abraham all the way down uh, through Joseph. Let's see how that's possible. Let me begin with a quotation from what I'm now calling the Sitbot. The Sitbot. C-I-T-B-O-T. -T, Catholic Introduction uh, to the Bible, Old Testament. <laughs> Got to come up with these catchy things, you know, to, to, to remember stuff. And I really like this description by John Bergsma and Brant Petrie. They describe the north and the south, the ten tribes in the north and the two tribes in the south, in terms of the Civil War in the United States. Listen to this. I'm reading from page 393. By way of analogy, one may think of the Union soldiers in the north and the Confederate soldiers in the south, both of whom would consider themselves true Americans. You know how in the South we like to say, the South is going to rise again. Uh, well, we, we all consider ourselves the authentic uh, descendants of the Founding Fathers. Uh, those who established the United States of America, uh, those in the North consider themselves, yes, this is what the Constitution was all about, that Thomas Jefferson and John Adams and George Washington and Benjamin Franklin all uh, helped to create. And we in the South say, no, this is what they originally envisioned and intended. Well, so too in Israel, the northern ten tribes, the southern two tribes are both vying for who is the authentic interpreter and the authentic descendants uh, of the original um, plan of God uh, in the first five books of the Bible. And the Samaritans are right in the mix. That's the way I'd like us to try to see the Samaritans, almost like the South. <laughs> and just as the South would try to create our own political uh, uh, distinction and self-governance, uh, our own country, uh, with, with our own set of rules and powers, so too the Samaritans understood themselves as creating their own country. And that the first five books of the Bible referred to them and not to the establishment of the Jews uh, in Judea. And so let's look now a little bit more closely with that kind of overarching analogy in mind of how that plays out in, uh, in the Bible. Now I'm going to read from the notes. I'm on page 25. Finally, we get to the notes. Holy cow. A Samaritan sandwich. Number two, letter A. Samaritan derives from the term meaning guardians of the Torah. You might remember Torah refers to the first five books of the Bible, the law. The first five books of the Bible. Hence, Samaritans believe they are its authentic interpreters, not the Jews in the South. Just like we would say, yeah, the South uh, is the authentic America, not the North. And they believe only the first five books of the Old Testament are inspired scripture. They exclude all else. Incidentally, the Sadducees also believe that way. Their, their stock was put in the first five books of the Bible for the Sadducees. So the Sadducees, Samaritans, both begin with S, easy to remember, uh, believed only in the first five books of the Bible as inspired scripture. Letter B, they were an isolated ethno-religious group descending from the tribes of Ephraim, and Manasseh, 
and people from Babylon, modern-day Iraq, with a mixed ancestry. And this is precisely why the Jews in the South rejected the Samaritans, loathed them, not just rejected them, despised them as second, not just as second-class citizens, but as, you know, idolaters. Not only do not worship in Jerusalem, where God wants them to worship, but worship idols, pagan gods. Letter C. The Davidic kingdom was divided in roughly 931 or 930 BC with the northern kingdom led by Jeroboam and the kingdom of Judah, the southern kingdom led by Rehoboam. So now you have the two leaders of the northern kingdom, also called Israel, and the southern kingdom called Judah under their two leaders, Jeroboam in the north and Rehoboam in the south. Now I want you to understand where the word Samaria, which is the core of the word Samaritan, where that comes from. The northern kingdom and Samaria are interchangeable terms. As, as we've been talking about how different words can mean the same thing. This is the first thing I learned when I came to Fort Smith, that the same person can have multiple names. And I knew I had to learn the maiden names of the women in Fort Smith because once they got married, they no longer used their maiden name. But you better know what that maiden name is because you might be talking to so-and-so and you realize you know, you're talking about their family and you didn't know it because you didn't know their maiden name. So too with all these names in the Bible, you have to kind of know their maiden name, their original meaning or their secondary or tertiary meaning. So Northern Kingdom and Samaria are interchangeable terms because the capital of the Northern Kingdom ultimately became the city of Samaria. And if you would take a, a minute to flip to your map on page 27, you will see that uh, in that middle section, it's kind of bluish gray, you have the name, uh, kind of where that blue arrow is, well, the blue arrow is pointing towards Samaria. You have the, in big bold letters, Sebast. And underneath it, in parentheses, you have Samaria. Well, that was the capital of that area, uh, well, of the northern kingdom. We're going back to 930 B.C. now. And here is the citation in the scriptures in 1 Kings chapter 16, verses 23 to 24. In the 31st year of Asa, king of Judah, Omri became the king of Israel. So Asa is in the south with the southern two kingdoms of Judah. Omri became the king of Israel. Remember one of the names of Israel is the ten northern tribes. He then bought the mountain of Samaria from Shemer for two silver talents and built upon the mountain the city he named Samaria after Shemer, the former, former owner. Now you know where Samaria comes from. It's the name of a guy named Shemer. And they kind of modified it and made it Samaria. And then in 2 Kings verse, uh, chapter 17, we read about 722, the Assyrian exile. So fast forward about 200 years. The king of Assyria took Samaria, the king of Assyria, this is the, the, the great, great enemy of the, the chosen people. The king of Assyria took Samaria, deported the Israelites, Israelites, and the Israelites are the ten tribes in the north to Assyria and settled them in Hala and at the harbor, the river of Gozan, and in the cities of the Medes. In other words, spread them out all over the world. The king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Kutha, Ava, Hama, and Sepharavam, and settled them in the cities of Samaria in the place of the Israelites. So the people who stayed behind in Samaria were intermingled, intermarried with the foreign peoples. And not only did they marry them, but they started practicing their religion. And therefore they became idolaters. They took possession of Samaria and dwelt in its cities, these people from Babylon and from Assyria. Verse 28, To this very day they continue to act according to their former customs. 
not venerating the Lord, nor observing the statutes and regulations, the laws and the commandment that the Lord enjoined on the descendants of Jacob. Jacob, Israel. Okay, keep those names kind of rolling around in your head and grab them as you need them. Whom he had named Israel. This, by the way, is the background for John chapter 4, where Jesus is traveling from Galilee to Judah, Judea, to Jerusalem in the south. He has to pass through Samaria. And whom does he meet? He meets a woman, the Samaritan woman, by a well. Whose well? Jacob's well. And he has this conversation about where is the right place to worship. If you don't understand this history between the Samaritans and the Jews, you will not understand the depth of the conversation that Jesus is having with this Samaritan woman in John chapter 4. Think also of the, the, the bloodshed and the rivalry and the civil war that erupted between the northern and southern United States. Uh, that gives us a little bit of a flavor of, of how intense uh, and volatile was the rivalry between Samaria and, and the Jews in the south. And why the place of worship wasn't just about, hey, where are you going to church this Sunday? It was about all power, political, economic, military, all kind of power, all judicial, executive power, all the power was rolled up in the temple. And so to answer the question, where do you worship, was ultimately about where is the source and center of power? God's power as well as secular power. It was not a small question. Where do you worship? And now I hope you begin to see the background to John chapter 4 and to Luke chapter 10 and the parable of the Good Samaritan. Let's keep reading. Letter E. Samaria, located geographically between Galilee, the northern area of Israel, and in Israel, when I use it in parentheses, I'm talking about the land area of Palestine. So you have this geographical land area of Israel, and Galilee is located in the north. And Judea, the southern area of Israel, also called Sebast or Samaria Semach. So if you come back to page 27, Galilee is in yellow. Do you see that area in the north, uh, right by the Sea of Galilee? That's Galilee. That's Jesus' uh, primary area of public ministry. He sets up his headquarters in Capernaum. Uh, he grows up in Nazareth. And you see all that there. You know how many times he's hanging out fishing at the Sea of Galilee, uh, calling fishermen who work in the Sea of Galilee. All of that's in the north. And you have to cross through that blue-gray area called Samaria to get to the south, which is kind of that hunter green, you might call it, of Judea. And there you see Jerusalem and Bethlehem. Okay? And that's the Dead Sea. So you get an idea and why I'm calling it the Samaritan sandwich. Not just because Clint Eastwood was chewing on a sandwich, but because it's in the middle of Galilee and Judea. Samaria is. Letter F. The Samarians. <laughs> Notice that wasn't a typo. I didn't accidentally forget to put the T in there. The Samarians means those who belong to the northern kingdom during this time between the divided kingdom and before the Assyrians came and destroyed the ten tribes of the north, they are called Samarians or Israelites. The Samaritans, letter F, describe the ethnically mixed people living in the central area of Israel after 722. So after the ten tribes have been obliterated, you have this mixed hybrid group of people called the Samaritans. And that's when they really come on the scene, after 722 BC. The significance of some key places, I'm going to blow through this pretty fast. The significance of Shechem, because you hear these words and you're like, what in the world? What? But here, get, get a sense, get a sense of this. The significance of Shechem. We're going to go all the way back to the very first book of the Bible. Genesis chapter 12, verse 6, that's it key chapter, the calling of Abraham and the sending him forth. Abraham passed through the land as far as the sacred place at Shechem. He has just now come into the promised land. By the oak of Moreh, the Canaanites were then in the land. Page 26, please. The Lord appeared to Abraham 
and he's at Shechem now. To your descendants I will give this land. So Abram built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Genesis 37. Now we fast forward. Abraham has his son Isaac. Isaac has Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons. His favorite son of Jacob was Joseph. And one day Jacob says to Joseph, go find your brothers and call them home. And the, 12, the 11 brothers of Jacob decide at first to kill him, but then to sell him into slavery. And so in Genesis 37, we read, One day when his brothers had gone to pasture their father's flock at Shechem, this is the, the brothers of, of Joseph, Israel said to Joseph, Israel there is the first meaning, Jacob's name. Jacob's name. So you could put there, instead of Israel said to Jacob, to Joseph, I mean, it says, Jacob said to Joseph, Are your brothers not tending the flocks at Shechem? Come, and I will send you to them. I am ready, Joseph answered. And then in 1 Kings 12, 25, Jeroboam built up Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim and lived there. Thus, original capital of the northern kingdom. So that's the importance of Shechem. When you have the divided kingdom, uh, in the north, Jeroboam decides to build his capital at Shechem. And then it moves from Shechem to Tirzah, and from Tirzah to Samaria. But originally it was Shechem. And you can understand the, the political and the historical and the theological importance of that, the religious importance, because that's where, excuse me, that's where Abraham originally landed in the Promised Land. And so Shechem is not some, you know, a backwater town with no significance. It is a the original arrival port of Abraham. Now let me tell you about two mountains very quickly, Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. Mount Gerizim is the one that the Samaritan woman is referring to, where they should worship. These two mountains were believed by the Samaritans as places of authentic worship. Why? Well, here's the background. Deuteronomy chapter 27, verses 4 through 6. When you cross the Jordan on Mount Ebal, you shall build there an, <clears throat> an altar to the Lord your God and offer on it burnt offerings to the Lord. So this is a place of authentic worship. Uh, Moses is speaking to the people on the plains of Moab in the book of Deuteronomy. And he says, when you cross over the Jordan into the promised land, worship at Mount Ebal. And then a little later, verses 12 through 13, when you cross the Jordan, these shall stand on Mount Gerizim. So you have these two opposing mountains. And it's kind of interesting what happens here. You have six tribes standing on Mount Ebal, and you have six tribes standing on Mount Gerizim. And we read, when you cross the Jordan, these shall stand on Mount Gerizim to bless the people. So that's the mountain of blessing. Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin. And these shall stand on Mount Ebal for the curse. And so, if you keep the commandments I give you, you will be blessed. If you forsake the commandments and break the commandments, you will be cursed. This is a, a covenant-making ceremony. Uh, very similar to what happened with uh, Abraham and uh, in, uh, in um, uh, Genesis chapter 15, where he splits the animal pieces and a, a blazing torch passes in between them. Now you have the tribes of Israel being split on two mountains and God's presence. And what's in between the two mountains? Shechem is in between Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. And God is making a covenant with the people. And so for the curse, on Mount Ebal you have Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. And then in Joshua chapter 8, we read later on Mount Ebal, Joshua built to the Lord, the God of Israel, an altar of unhewn stone, just as Moses had commanded. And all Israel stood on either side of the ark facing the Levitical priests who were carrying the ark of the covenant of the Lord. So now you have the ark of the covenant, God's presence in the middle. And you have the, the divided tribes, six on one side, six on the other, one on Mount Ebal for the uh, blessing and one on Mount Gerizim. Uh, I'm sorry, one on Mount Gerizim for the blessing and one on Mount Ebal for the curse. Half of them were facing Mount Gerizim and half Mount Ebal, just as the Lord had first commanded for the blessing of the people of Israel. And then we get to John chapter 4. Finally, our ancestors, says the woman of Samaria at Jacob's well in John chapter 4, the Samaritan woman, worshipped on this mountain, Mount Gerizim. That's where they are. 
That's where they meet. But you people, meaning the Jews from Judah, say that the place of worship is in Jerusalem. And then the Samaritans' tradition uh, maintains that Mount Gerizim is the oldest, tallest, and most central mountain in the world. The temple on Mount Gerizim was a rival, as I mentioned, in the 5th century, the 400s, what built a temple in Jerusalem where Samaritans celebrate Passover annually and where they believe Isaac was bound. Now they're going to reinterpret uh, Genesis 22 and say that it was not on Mount Moriah, which is one of the hillsides of, of Jerusalem, uh, around Jerusalem, in Genesis 22, that's where Isaac was bound. They're going to say, no, it was on Mount Gerizim. You can see why they both want to claim uh, Abraham as their ancestor, their ancestor, not in Jerusalem. It was on Mount Gerizim. Furthermore, the location of Solomon's temple in 1 Kings 8 indicated it was Jerusalem. But they're going to say, no, it was Mount Gerizim. And again, it's not just a religious conflict. It is at root political, military, economic, uh, intellectual. In every way a society can be organized, it was centered around the temple. And where the temple was supposed to be located meant everything for a society. Why are we calling this a Samaritan sandwich? Well, because they despised the Galileans to the north and the Jews to the south. The Samaritans excluded the Galileans to the north saying that the northern tribes split from, them, flip, split from them, the Samaritans, when the priest Eli moved worship from Shechem to Mount Shiloh. So the, <clears throat> the Galileans in the north are loyal to the Jews in the south. That's the, that's the amazing thing about it. Even though they're further north than the Samaritans, uh, they are actually more loyal to the Jew, J Jerusalem temple. And that's why Jesus finds a very friendly company in Galilee uh, and why he travels to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover and his disciples would with him um, because they were loyal to where the worship should be performed in the Jerusalem temple. Uh, the Samaritans go all the way back to the time of Samuel. Samuel would have been the time of the United Kingdom. In 1 Samuel 1, 9, Hannah rose after one such meal at Shiloh and presented herself before the Lord at the time Eli, the priest, was sitting on a chair near the doorpost of the Lord's temple. Shiloh is also in the south. They're saying, you guys have blown it, those of you, uh, the northern uh, tribes. Uh, no wonder you guys were sent into exile and deported by the Assyrians because we're the authentic uh, guardians of the Torah, the Samaritans are. The Samaritans maintain they are the survivors of the Assyrian destruction of the northern kingdom of Samaria in 722, and hence true Israelites, just like we here in the south are the true Americans, not them northerners, not them Yankees. While the Jews from Judah separated from Samaria, and as I mentioned, John Hyrcanus, the high priest, the military commander from Judah, laid siege to the city of Samaria and completely destroyed it, and the temple, and the temple. How was your sandwich? <laughs> uh, I hope this gave you a little bit of sense of uh, what's in the background uh, when Jesus is telling the story of the Good Samaritan and how that really chapped the Jews that were hearing that parable. Uh, because what's good about the Samaritans? They're pagans, they're idolaters, they're half-breeds, they're, they're, they're hybrids, worshiping pagan gods, these idols in Gerizim. And you're holding them up as a hero? Exactly. Because Jesus' mission is not just to save the Jews, the south, the southern two tribes of Benjamin and Judah, but to save all of Israel and ultimately to save the whole world. And that's how the Samaritans fit so critically into the purpose of the Gospel of Luke because that's what Jesus wants to do. Uh, he wants to save not only the Jews, 
not only the Israelites, all 12 tribes, but the whole world. Now let's see what we're going to talk about next time. I'm so excited. Who are we going to talk about? The one who goes to the Gentiles, to the whole world. Because then he knows that's what Jesus' mission is. He's the one who taught it to Luke, who then programmed it into his gospel. Who are we talking about? Saul, better known as St. Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. And so next time, what are we going to do? Better call Saul. <laughs> Please read Luke chapters 14, 1 through 15, 32. I expanded that a little bit too from your notes. The footnotes 135 to 37, also trusting the ten testaments in consuming the word, pages 85 through 100. I know you're going to love it. Because I love it. And God loves it. Because he's the one who inspired these pages. And so let us ask him to continue to inspire us as we read the Gospel of Luke, love the Gospel of Luke, and ultimately live the Gospel of Luke. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Jerome, pray for us. St. Luke, pray for us. You did feel lucky, didn't you? <laughs>